Good morning, church. Would you guys stand with us this morning? If it's your first time here at Calvary Chapel, I want to welcome you personally. My name is Andrew, and we are so glad you've joined us this weekend. We're still pumped about what God did at our church last weekend. Last weekend, at all of our campuses, over 400 people made a decision for Jesus Christ. Yeah, we should celebrate that. So this weekend, we're finishing our series uh, called The Sermon That Changed the World, The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' Words. And so today, as we study Matthew 7, we're excited to hear from God and to hear what He has to say to us through His Word. And we've got a little something new for worship today. We're doing an unplug set, and uh, I've invited my friend Ted, Ted Yoder on the Hammer Dulcimer to join us. Would you guys welcome Ted? And we're excited to worship God with you guys in this place. So meet somebody new, say hi to somebody around you, and then we're going to sing to Jesus together.
breaks. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Sing. 
face to face in the presence of our Father, our Lord Jesus forever. Isn't that amazing? And even now we believe His presence is here with us. We worship Him in the beauty of His holiness. Lord, we just thank You. We thank You, Lord, that in Your presence is the fullness of joy, Jesus. And now we worship You for You are good. We'll sing on that day. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise. Out says is true. 
It's for our good. And so we're gonna close our time of worship this weekend with a little surprise. So last night it was a big surprise, but we've done it a couple times now. Uh, next Sunday is our pastor's birthday, Pastor Doug's birthday. Next Sunday, yeah. And there's this song that he talks about in his sermons every once in a while. And it's a Rich Mullins song. Anybody in this place remember Rich Mullins? Yeah. And the song is called Creed, and it's just a confession of what we believe. And uh, Doug references it a lot. It meant a lot to him when he first came to Christ. And the lyrics just ministered to his heart. So we wanted to bless him with it as a way of just saying thank you, that we love you, and thank you for your leadership. And uh, we hope you have an awesome birthday. And so this song, you're, you may not know it, and that's totally cool. And you may not be able to sing along, and that, that's totally cool too. But we want you to worship with your heart because this is what we believe, that Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for us, rose again on the third day, and is reigning at the right hand of the Father in heaven right now, seated on the throne. So if you wanna sing along, awesome. If you wanna clap along, great. But just be blessed as we sing and celebrate the truth of who our God is and what he's done. This is Creed.
Church, let's pray together. God, we believe it. What you tell us is true. Your faithfulness, Lord, never fails. Your mercies are new and your heart towards us is good. Every perfect, every good and perfect gift comes from you. So we love you, Jesus, and we confess that in this place and what we just sang, we believe it with our hearts. God, help us to live it out with love in our lives. God, thank you for Pastor Doug and for Suzanne and for their family. We pray blessings on them, especially this week. We pray that you just um, fill him with your spirit. God, give him wisdom from on high as he leads, as he prays, as he studies the word. And Lord, as he comes now just to teach us, I pray that you would fill us with expectancy. God, be, being ready to hear the word, that it would fall on good ground, Lord, of our hearts, and it would bear good fruit. That's the kind of believers we want to be. Lord, bearing good fruit, built on the foundation, the rock, Christ Jesus, God. And when we're built on that foundation, Lord, the storms are going to come. You tell us in this world you will have trouble. But Lord, we can take heart because you have overcome the world, Jesus. We believe that in this place. So thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. So God, we open our Bibles and we want to hear from you. We're here to hear from you. So Spirit, speak. Your servants are listening. And we're ready to love our world. In the name of Jesus, we pray all of this together. And all of God's people said... Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning, Calvary Chapel family. What an amazing surprise. It was an awesome thing to hear. An old Rich Mullen song, again, uh, from a flashback. If you guys don't know, uh, he was one of those Christian artists who wrote, Our God is an awesome God, and all those kind of things back when my wife and I got saved. It's awesome to hear kind of a remix of that and think about all the memories. Because so many of our greatest memories are with some of the worship songs and hymns that we've heard back in the day that shape us and make us who we are. So thank you to our worship team. And just thank you to all of our campuses for being part of this amazing family. My, Suzanne and I are so blessed to be a part of this church. Hey, if you're a guest here in the house, we are so glad you're back, especially because Easter was, we, we had over 30,000 people at all of our campuses and over 400 people made professions of faith. It was an amazing, amazing time. I want to celebrate the hundreds of new families who came, who you invited, who felt welcome here. And, and we just want to say if you're back, we're so glad you're here. Um, and if you have a Bible, we'd love for you to open to Matthew chapter 7. And if you don't, raise your hand. Uh, again, if you're a guest here, we want to put a Bible in your hand. This is going to be our gift to you. It's God's word. Because here at Calvary, we're a people of the book. This book will change your life if you read it with an open heart. So grab one, open to Matthew 7 and 1 Corinthians 3 as we finish up this sermon, the sermon that changed the world. And as we uh, talked about Easter, uh, one of the questions that we asked at all of our services was this. In what area do you want to begin again? It's kind of one of those reflective questions. We think about the year ahead. What's an area that if God could do a new work in me, I would want to see him do it in this area. Whether it's your marriage and family or parenting or your finances or an area of brokenness in your life or redemption. We have a whole series of classes that we've sort of completely changed our Wednesday night format just for you. So you can find a way to, to practically put this sermon that we're about to read into practice in your own life. Building your house on a rock. So if you haven't already decided what that area is, we want you to look at the guide we've given you or go online and pick the class uh, that's just for you. And if you're brand new here, we have a connect experience just to help you know what our church family is all about. So we hope that you invest the next few weeks in this kind of practical application of your faith. And as well, there's going to be a baptism happening next weekend. If you've never been water baptized, we'd love for you to be a part of that great celebration. And, and I just want to say for all of you who have faithfully given and served here, 
What happened last weekend, the, the, the hundreds of people who volunteered, the thousands of people who gave to pull off last weekend at all of our campuses, it's because of that generous investment that God continues to pour out his favor and grace on this place. So thank you for being a generous church, a church that serves, a church that invites your friends because we serve a generous God and we should give him praise for his goodness to us. Let's give it up for our God, Calvary Chapel. He's a faithful, faithful God. And we also want to let you know that three weeks ago, we, we talked to our church about our vision for our community and for our world. We called it Vision 2023, the next five years of Calvary Chapel, and the areas we really want to focus on. And we really talked about seven key areas that we shared with you three weeks ago. And after the service today, you're going to have a chance to actually sit in a kind of an after-church vision meeting and just hear from the different areas, whether it's foster care or elderly care or family and marriage or, or church planting and evangelism. Or how we can step into the education, the schools in our community, in the business world, and really make a difference for the kingdom. If you're one of those people that was like, yeah, three weeks ago when I heard that, now what do I do? You have a chance to meet with some of those leaders who behind the scenes have been working and praying, some for six months, nine months, about how we can help shape what God is showing us into actual practical path for people to be mobilized in our community. So after our service, we'd love for you to be a part of that at any of our campuses. And then finally, as we look forward to next week, Next weekend, we're going to kick off a four-week series on heaven. What is heaven going to be like? And we, as a pastoral teaching team, have been digging into the Word and seeing so much of what the Bible has to say about heaven. Not, not what social media has to say about heaven or what Oprah has to say about heaven or what the latest book has to say about heaven. No, we want to know what God says about heaven because he made it for us. And we are going there because of Jesus' death. And resurrection. And so we want to get familiar with the place before we get there. And uh, you're going to love this study. So as we get ready to prepare our hearts for today, uh, we're just going to pray and ask him to speak to us by his spirit. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for last weekend. Thank you for just the faithfulness of this church to give and to serve and to invite people. And, and we see this incredible celebration of your resurrection. And this weekend we get to do it again. Every day we get to celebrate your resurrection from the dead and your power in our lives. And Father, as we now reflect on our, our, our life and how we can build a spiritual house that will last into eternity, give us wisdom and insight. Speak to us beyond our busy, frenetic minds, beyond our worries and anxieties, beyond our traditional beliefs about who you are and how you can work in our lives. We pray you would break through in a whole new way. And we thank you in advance for doing that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the last several weeks, we've been looking at this Sermon on the Mount. We call it the Sermon that Changed the World. Jesus got his followers to follow him up this mountainside and began to break down just the truths of the kingdom of God. And he closes with a very practical story. In fact, the last part of chapter 7 is just the whole application of all these truths of the value of the kingdom. And we're going to start at the very end with his final parable and then work our way back to the chapter. And so in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 24, Jesus says this to those who followed him up that mountain. Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Jesus is saying to all those who are following up the hill that our lives are like a house. It's his picture, and he's helping all of his disciples just to consider this. Evaluate how you are building your life. You see, a lot of times in life, we don't stop, take stock, and evaluate, how am I building my life? And Jesus says, your, your, your life is a lot like a house. I mean, there are a lot of references in the Bible about, unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. The way we build a house, and Jesus says there's two ways to build a house. And on the outside, the houses look identical. But the part you can't see, the part that matters most is what is that house built on? What is the foundation? He says, there was a wise man who heard my words and put them into practice. There was a foolish man who heard my words but did not put them into practice. And for a while, the houses looked the same. On the outside, they looked 
identical. But the only way you really know how good your foundation is, is when a storm comes. And Jesus is not giving us a command here. He's giving us an observation. He's saying a house can look identical on the outside. But when the storm comes, and a storm will come, and the rain and the wind will beat on your house, you'll see in the end how you built your house. And it's interesting, when the storms of life come, we know. How strong what was our financial picture? How strong was our marriage? How strong was our faith when this, this storm comes? And we have physical storms that illustrate this for us. I mean, Hurricane Irma j- just hit, and we went down to the Keys, and we saw, we saw pictures that describe this parable. I mean, this, this is one of the, the most telling. It's two houses right next to each other. They, they look almost identical from the outside, but there was something different about how they were built. Maybe the, the structure, maybe, maybe the materials, but the storm revealed something about each house, and Jesus is saying, your life is like that. And you want your house to be safe and secure. You don't want to have this great crash. What is that like? He says, well, the Christian life is not just following me up the mountain. The Christian life is not just praying and walking forward at an altar call and saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I want to follow you. No, he's saying that for the Christian, the, the prayer to believe in him, the prayer to confess your sins is just the beginning, and now you start to follow. You start to walk. In fact, the early church was called the way. It's a way of life. It's not just a belief in your head. It's a way that you do your finances. It's a way that you do your relationships. It's the way that you see the world. It's the way you guard your sexual purity. It's the way your mindset is in the world. And he says, this way will be distinct from other people in the world. Sometimes the Bible will say, that's peculiar. It's different. Do people still live that way? And Jesus is saying, Yes, they do, and they can, and this chapter is all about the application of that. In fact, Solomon encourages us to build our house this way. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. And through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. This is one of my favorite verses, especially for young people. For young people who are just starting out their life and going to college. For young people who are thinking about getting married and they sit down like, how do I build a marriage? And you can talk about, you know, there is a way to build a relationship with wisdom and knowledge and understanding. So at the end, each room in your house that you're building is full of rare and precious treasures. And you're not afraid of the storm to come because you know your foundation is on the rock. You put into practice the words of Jesus. This life is possible. And Jesus is inviting all the people who followed him up on the mountain that day to step into this life. Now, if you're here and you're like, oh man, I didn't build my house that way. In fact, I've just suffered a couple of devastating life circumstances in my life that revealed that really my faith and the way I've been living is not really, wasn't really built to last. Well, I just want to say this, you're in a great place. Because if there's ever a safe place to rebuild your life, It's the church. It's the family of God. And I want to show you a picture of what that looked like. Because just like those houses in the Keys got devastated, hundreds of people from this church went down to the Keys and helped repair roofs and helped cut trees off houses and helped love homeowners and pray for them and care for them and generously donate so they could get their lives back in order. And you know in the church, in a spiritual sense, that happens here every single week. If you want to rebuild your life, yeah, we can give God (laughs) praise. For this family, if you want to rebuild your life, here's what you won't find here. You won't find people who are going to look at you and go, why would you build your house like that? That was stupid. Now you're suffering for your poor decisions. Stinks to be you. No. No, we, what we say is, you know what? I, I built my house like that one time too. And I suffered a devastating life circumstance. But you know what? Someone helped me. So now I want to help you with the help I received because there is a way to walk in the abundance that Jesus invites us to. You can rebuild your life. You can begin Again, this is the hope of the gospel. And this is what Jesus is teaching his followers on this sermon on the mount. So we're going to go all the way back to verse 1 and kind of talk about this house that Jesus is talking about building. And the first area is just the way we relate with people that are around us. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus says this. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. 
First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And do not give what is holy to dogs, or cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you into pieces. Jesus says, judge not, lest you be judged. Do not judge, because the same measure you judge someone else will be judged to you. You know, this is the second most popular, well-known verse outside of the church. The only other verse that people who don't go to church know more than don't judge or you'll be judged is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's the one at football games, John 3.16. It's the one Billy Graham talked about all the time. But, but, but here's my question. Why do people outside the church know this verse as the second most well-known verse in the Bible? Well, it could be because someone at a church judged them. You're going to hell. I know there's no hope for you. You're a mess. Or it's because they're trying to make excuses for themselves because they don't want anyone to tell them what to do. Either way, it's a verse that can easily be manipulated. And Jesus is going to go into great detail about this idea of judgment, of pronouncing judgment on another person. Person. It's the Greek word krina. But before we talk about that, I just want to give you the principle he's sharing with his early followers, and that's this. Ruthlessly eliminate self-righteousness from your life. Ruthlessly eliminate self-righteousness from your life because if you're filled with self-righteousness, you're not going to have healthy, thriving relationship. Your house is not going to be built to last. And how many of you know you don't have to be religious to be self-righteous? What's the definition of self-righteousness? It's a certainty that in an area of your life, you are correct. In some cases, morally superior to the person you're in conflict with. Have you ever thought you were right when you weren't? Come on. You can do it. I know you can do it. If you're sitting next to someone you know, raise their hand for them. I mean, you, we see this all the time. I don't know if you've ever been driving, and you're driving along, you're trying to follow GPS, and you're like, hmm, I'm not lost. I, I just don't know where I am. <laughs> and then you finally admit that you're lost, and your wife knew it 30 minutes earlier, but you were pretty sure. <laughs> Guys, women always know you're lost before you realize you're lost. Did you, didn't you know that? But you were certain. You were certain you were right. You were certain either Siri was wrong or, or the road signs were wrong. And you, you see, we, we, when we have a, a conflict or when we, we have that pressure, there's always something in us that wants to be right and doesn't want to be wrong. When you're in an argument, you don't want to be the person that has to admit they're wrong. You want to be right. And so we have this infinite amount of justification and rationalization we can go through to convince ourselves that when we're wrong, we are still right. I remember when my wife and I, when we first got married, uh, we... We would always like have these kind of just random conversations about who is the actor in that movie or what's our favorite meal at that restaurant. Was it that restaurant or another restaurant? And when we went on vacation, was it that place or that place? And we get to this like, no, it was this, no, it was that. And, and so we'd end up doing this. We'd end up saying, I bet you, I bet you I'm right. <laughs> and our currency, I bet you a 30-minute back rub that I'm right and you're wrong. We had a gambling problem. So I noticed, like, the first couple years of our marriage, I was giving my wife a lot of back rubs. And I was like, huh. I was, like, totally convinced that I was right about who the actor was or where the restaurant was. And I'm realizing, man, there's a lot of times when you are sure, absolutely sure, that you are right and you're not. And Jesus says, that's self-righteousness. You believe you're right and they're wrong. And if you live in self-righteousness, that you're right and other people are wrong a lot, you're going to live a pretty empty, lonely life. You see, I want you to think about your last fight, your last argument. And some of you are like, okay, can we talk about that in church? And you might call it strong fellowship. You might call it any kind of number of things that you want to call it. But when you got into a conflict last week or the week before, there was a moment, if you think about it, where you were like, why cannot that person see that I'm right and they're wrong? Hmm. It's interesting, like Jesus says, there are moments in life where your friend has a splinter in their eye. You can see what's wrong with them, but you're trying to get it out and you've got a log in your own eye. 
You see, getting a splinter out of your friend's eye is a delicate process, and it requires really good vision and a steady hand and a heart that's for that person to help them, not a sledgehammer to prove that you're right and they're wrong. It's interesting, right? You could be like roommates. Like imagine three roommates in a college dorm. You're all friends. You all think this is going to be great. You move in together and you realize one of these guys is a slob. He leaves his dishes in the sink every single night. He leaves clothes everywhere. There could be this tendency on the part of, of the other two to say, you know what? You're not as good of a roommate as we are. But then the other roommate, well, he can't see that he plays loud music till 1 o'clock in the morning and keeps everyone up. And the other roommate hasn't paid his rent for three months and everyone else is scrambling to keep the lights on. It's easy to see other people's faults. It's hard to see your own. And Jesus says, you don't have to be religious to be self-righteous, but, but religious self-righteousness is the worst kind. In fact, he spent a lot of time talking to people who had this sense of religious superiority. God likes me better. I'm actually moral, morally superior to other people that are around me. In fact, in Luke 18, he tells this story. You don't have to turn there. Just listen to the story. It's such a telling picture of self-righteousness. Jesus spoke this parable to those who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and they looked down on others. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus to himself, saying, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. This is not a good start to a prayer extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tithe of all I possess. The tax collector stood afar off. He would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, two men walked into the temple that day, and one of them walked away justified, heard by God. And it wasn't the guy who was praying about himself, wishing everyone else was like him. Now, I don't think we consciously do this. God, I thank you that I'm not like all these other people. And you're probably blessed to have me too. <laughs> but if we're not careful, we'll start to look down on people that suffer from particular sins or people who haven't been beat certain sins, and we won't be able to see our own blindness. And when we get to this place of, of judgment, crino, sitting on the judgment seat, pronouncing judgment, I am judge and jury and executioner. You are wrong. You are guilty. You are stuck in this category in my mind. You stand or sit in the seat of God, and that's an exhausting burden that you cannot bear because you were not meant to, to be the judge. God is the judge. We're here to dispense his grace. We're here to speak the truth. We're here to guide people and pull out splinters but once we've taken the logs out of our own eyes. This is why Jesus would say to us, if you're going to build a life that is going to last, you need to ruthlessly eliminate self-righteousness from your life. Because, you know, self-righteousness really is just a lack of self-awareness if we're really going to be real. If you really think you're better than other people, there is a lack of self-awareness in your life that a good friendship can help you with, that accountability can help you with, where you can say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me the areas of my life and why I might be judging that person. Sometimes it's jealousy. Sometimes it's insecurity in myself. Why do I feel it's my responsibility to point at everything that's wrong in other people's lives and be this judge, be this critical person? It's not our job. That's the job of the Holy Spirit and God the Father who sits on the throne in heaven. And now Jesus, yeah, we can clap. We can thank God that he is the judge. Because if any of us were the judge, there'd be a lot of dead people. I'm just saying, there'd be a lot of dead people. His mercy is new every morning. Our mercy has gone by 9 o'clock. <laughs> Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? But if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets." Jesus uses this phrase. He says, ask, seek, knock. 
And in the Greek, these are continuous imperative words, which means it's not just ask once, but keep asking. Not just seek once, but keep seeking. Don't just knock once, but keep knocking. Continuously seek God. Continuously ask God. Continuously knock, and the door will be open because God wants to give you these amazing gifts. And if we can summarize the principle Jesus is teaching here, it's this. Never give up on your pursuit of God. Never give up on your pursuit of God. Whether you've been a Christian for a week or a month or a year or a decade or turning close to a century, never give up on your pursuit of God. Pursue God every day. Because he has something to teach you. He has good gifts for you. You think about the patriarchs in the Bible, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. You think about Moses and David. There was this continuous pursuit in their lives. If you read their life story, Abraham didn't just talk to God one time and follow him. Abraham just didn't, didn't have this moment of covenant revelation, then not talk to God. He kept going deeper and deeper, and the test kept getting harder and harder, and the glory that kept getting revealed became greater and greater. You think of Moses on the mountain. Moses, the first time he went up Mount Sinai after he led the entire nation of Israel outside of Egypt. He went to the mountain. God gave him the Ten Commandments. He came down. He saw this golden calf, this pagan party, and he destroyed these tablets. And God sent him back on the mountain. But the second time he went on the mountain, there was a little more soberness, a little more brokenness, a little more desire, God, I want to know you. And he makes a request the second time he goes up on the mountain that he didn't make the first time. He says in Exodus 33, God, could you show me your glory? I want to see your glory. I want to talk to you face to face like a man talks to his friend. Show me your glory. And he got a glimpse of the glory of God like no one else because his desire was to continue to press in. We should have this holy discontent in our relationship with God so that we pursue even more to know him at deeper and deeper and deeper levels and find deeper levels of joy and trust and glory. This is what Jesus is saying. If you pursue him and you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. He's not going to give you a serpent. He wants to give good gifts to you. This is my father. This is our God. And then in verse 12, we see this pursuit of God leads to something. It's called the golden rule. You might have heard it this way. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And Jesus says this fulfills all all the law, all the prophets, the entire Old Testament can be summed up in that phrase, you do unto others as you would have them do to you. You could write it down this way, if you love God, you will invest in others. So here's the idea. If you see a splinter in your brother's eye, you're not to judge him like, what's wrong with you? You're to love God and the love that God pours in your life. You'll be able to love him and serve him like you would want to be served if you had a splinter in your eye. In other words, if you're going to point out that someone has dirty feet, you better be willing to wash them because that's what a servant does. And that takes a lot of security in who you are in God. It takes a lot of knowing I've been loved by God. There's no task that's below me. So if I see someone who's struggling, I'm going to enter into their struggle and I'm going to love them like Jesus loved me, not with judgment, but with service. And if you're a note taker, you can write it down this way. If you love God, you will invest in others. This is what disciples do. They continuously pursue a relationship with God. God, I want to be connected to you. They pursue a relationship with others. I want to be connected with other people. I want to serve them as he served me. And there's something about the early disciples that was so attractive. You know, we've been talking about this definition of what a disciple is. Here's the simplest version I can give you from what I see in the scripture, and that's this. A disciple is a fully devoted, reproducing follower of Christ. Fully devoted. What does that mean? The early believers were passionate. And you know, passion attracts people. I mean, it doesn't matter what they're passionate about. I was hanging out with this, this guy last weekend, and he was talking about, like, fitness. He was talking about, like, the food he was eating. And I was like, man, I just want to eat a cheeseburger listening to you talk, but whatever. I mean, he was so excited. I kept leaning into the conversation about how much weight he had lost and all these resumes he going through and how alive and energetic he felt. And I was like, this guy is passionate about what he's doing, and it makes me want to lean in. When people hear you talk about what God's done in your life, do they lean in? When you talk about what happened at church this weekend or how God delivered you or healed you or how he's working in your family and your business, do they lean in? 
Or do you keep a lot of that just to yourself? Passion attracts. But it's not just passion. It's also authenticity. People want to know, is this for real? Because, you know, you can be passionate and plastic and fake and a half inch deep. But when the passion is real, it comes from your soul. People know for you that it's real. And authenticity sounds like this. Man, I, I do not believe all the things that God has done in my life. It, just, it blows my mind because I know I don't deserve this. Because my life used to be a total wreck. And I've got no judgment. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just saying that I was here and God saved me. I was blind and now I see it. I just want you to know what I found out. This beats in my soul. This is who I am. And I want you to know that, you know, that kind of passion, that kind of authenticity can change the world. You invest in people. People see that it's real in you. And they want what you want and they lean in when you talk. And this is how Christianity spread throughout the first century as believers filled with the Holy Spirit, went out and invested in other people. And I want to share with you how it happens today. Maybe in ways that are all around you that you just have never thought about, even with complete strangers. Take a look at this video. This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family, and he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life, ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James, who was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. What if all of us invested in just one person? This year, we have no idea. 
the chain of events that would happen, that would be a lot like this video, that we would not be able to see and celebrate until we got into heaven. What, what, what if? The gospel that spread in the first century did again this century because we took this command serious to, to love our neighbor as ourself, to do unto others as we would want others to do to us. The greatest way to love your neighbor is to invest in them the gospel of the kingdom, the way Jesus did to his disciples, the way his disciples did to those who followed him, and chain after chain unbroken all the way to us, the gospel is still changing lives and saving souls. This is the great commission that we are called to live out, to go into all the world and share the gospel and teach people to obey what Jesus commanded even to the end of the age. It's our mission. And we celebrate our mission here at Calvary. And that's why part of Vision 2023 is for us to say, who is that one person? And how do we find on-ramps? I mean, part of the next six weeks that we've been talking about at Easter and before that is, is find ourselves around a table with someone else who we can invest in. And you probably might be thinking, you know what? Honestly, Doug, I don't know that I have a lot to offer because I've only been a Christian for a year. Here's what I want to say to you. You're ahead of someone because there's people in this room who have only been Christians for a month. And you know what, if you've only been a Christian for a month, you're actually ahead of someone. Because some people, they just got saved last weekend. You see, we're always ahead of someone and behind someone. And reaching forward to have someone who's been before us disciple us and invest in us helps us then to reach back and invest in someone else. If you've been walking in sobriety from drugs and alcohol for just a year or two, there are people that need to hear your story and know it's possible. For those who have gone through tragic life circumstances, people need to know it's possible that the hope of the gospel can reign in your life and they can see this, this attraction, this, this hope, this power of God working through even your brokenness. And, and that's why we're inviting you to say, just if you don't know who that person is, just go to one of these classes and sit around the table. And after six weeks, I can promise you that God will whisper something to you. You'll, you'll feel or sense something with someone that you're sitting with going, you know what? I think I can offer them something that someone once offered me. And that relationship might just be like, hey, let's have a cup of coffee and let's start meeting on Mondays. And you never know what will happen next. I remember 20 years ago, sitting at a Promise Keepers event and hearing the speaker say this. And it sort of shocked me when he said it. But, but here's what he said. You will never reach your full potential as a Christian until you help someone else reach theirs. That's kind of a profound thought that part of the Christian life is not just about you in isolation, but it's about you investing in someone else and changing their life. And that's what ripples into eternity. Because when Jesus talks about building your house on the rock, he's not just talking about a house that lasts until eternity. He's talking about a house that will flow into eternity. In 1 Corinthians 3, if you could turn there, we're going to see a picture of how your life lived here is tested there, not by wind and water, but by fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 describes the Bema seat judgment. Now, this is not the judgment where people get into heaven or not, where they go to heaven or hell. This is actually a judgment for Christians who have trusted their faith in Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of their life, and they've been forgiven of their sins. This is where the rewards are distributed in heaven where you actually look at everything you've done on the foundation of Christ and all your work is evaluated. And here's how Paul describes this, much like the building of a house. At the end of verse 9, he says, you are God's building. In verse 10, he says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, yet he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Paul's going into like a great detailed description saying, listen, this is a judgment for people who have already been saved. The fire just tests their work. And he says, you know, some people that are Christians, they build their life after they get saved with wood and hay and straw. In other words, they're doing things in life that are not eternal. So I got saved and I built a new house for myself. 
And I got saved, and I, I bought a new car, and I got saved, and we went on this great vacation, and we enjoyed our family together, and we do all these things, and at the end of the age, everything you've spent your time and energy and thought process and resources on is now evaluated and tested by fire, and if it's all about yourself, you're going to watch your entire life's work go up in smoke. Still saved, but barely escaping the flames because your life is all about you. But then he says there's some people, when they get saved, they start thinking about eternally building their house. How can I serve other people? How can I invest my resources into building the kingdom of God? How can I do something that's going to last outside of me? And when those people sit at the judgment, not only will they be saved, but whatever lasts, gold, silver, and precious stones, is going to be their reward, listen, for all eternity. There's going to be a lot of joy on that day, but also some regret for Christians who say, why did I waste my life just on myself? Jesus is giving people a warning. Paul's saying, prepare for your whole future. It's going to ripple into eternity. So the question for us is, am I doing anything right now that's an investment in the eternal? And if not, how can I start? I mean, part of the vision 2023 we've talked about as a church is all these project teams. Three weeks ago, we laid out these seven key areas where we want people to go, hey, is there an area that I could really press into? I've got a, a, a heart desire to see our schools change. I've got a heart desire to see foster care be moved forward. I've got a heart desire just for the elderly community in South Florida. I want to see churches planted. I want to see more people get saved. I want to see businesses mobilized to build the kingdom of God. If any of those things burn in your heart after our service, you have a chance to sit down with people who've been thinking and praying and dreaming and talking about building kingdom initiatives because here's what I believe. I believe God wants to use this church to do things that are beyond us and bigger than us that when we get to eternity... We see the fruit of like a video like that and see how many thousands of lives were changed because we were willing to step forward and take a risk and invest into eternity. This is what God wants us to experience in the kingdom. And this is why Jesus gives us this great challenge. And now we go back to Matthew chapter 7. And the next and last few verses, we see a sober warning from Jesus. Often when we, when we hear about Jesus speaking, we typically get the tendency, oh, it's love and joy and peace and don't judge anybody and let everyone do what they want and everyone's accepted and kumbaya and it's all good in the end. But Jesus is going to give people a reality check in these next few verses. Here's what he says in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go on it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are only a few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Sober words from the Son of God. And I think everyone who was sitting on that mountain that day was kind of like, wow, if I'm going to build my life like this house that's going to last, I need to reprioritize some things. I need to make some things that, that are just sort of beliefs and ideas in my life. I need to make them real and practice in my life. And if you're a note taker, you can write down this point this way. Look for truth on the narrow road. Jesus is saying not all roads lead to God. There's this wide road that a lot of people are on, but the wide road where everyone is leads to destruction. But very few people will go on this narrow road. And this applies to so many things in life. It applies to salvation. There's a lot of people who have a lot of ideas of how you get to heaven, but Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. I am the door. I am the door and I'm the way to the Father. He's offering us this way of escape. And he's saying, a very few people will press into that. So many other people will go, well, I, I want to find another way. I want to do it myself. Or I'm going to figure it out when I get there. And 
That's not the way you're going to find life. But it's also how we live our lives. When you think about just finances in general, it's often you're on a narrow way sometimes as, as a Christian. You're like, well, why, why, why are only a few people doing this? It looks like everyone else is doing this. And people over here financially are like, no, you don't, you don't give generously to other people. You keep it for yourself. You spend as much as you can on yourself. You, even if you have to go into debt, you just live life, enjoy it. You don't need to save a lot. You don't need to give a lot. You know those kind of ideas, that kind of mindset leads to destruction. It leads to slavery. It leads to bondage. It leads to bondage to greed, bondage to debt. And a lot of people are on that road. Jesus says, you know, there's a different way. You can flip the way the world does things and you can do them God's way. You see, the first thing you do when God gives you resources is you give. You give your first and you give your best to show that you understand that everything comes from God. It's an act of worship. And then after you give, then you make a plan to save. And then you spend what's left. You flip the script that everyone else is on the wide road and you live in this narrow road and you find this amazing freedom and joy that not everyone else knows. When it comes to sexual purity, when it comes to the things you watch and listen to, there's a wide road that says, do whatever you want. You have the liberty and freedom. And you have a, a more narrow road that says, you know, whatever is good and pure and true and a good report, think and meditate on these things. And we all have a choice. Narrow road wide road. And Jesus says there's very few people who walk this narrow road because on a narrow road there's friction. It's more uphill. It's more of a difficult path, but it is the path that leads to freedom. Dave Ramsey says it this way, if you want to live like no one else is living, you have to do what no one else is doing. And there's a lot of truth to that statement. A lot of people want to live a certain kind of way, but they're doing like they always did, and they still find themselves in bondage. And then in verse 21, very sober words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is essentially saying most people aren't going to make it to heaven. There's more people on the wide road than the narrow road. And there's a lot of people who just sort of assume, well, of course I'm going to go to heaven because I've done more good than bad. And God, remember I was in church? Remember I fed the homeless that weekend? Remember I prayed that prayer for that person? Don't you remember? But we see the criteria to get into heaven is not just what you believe in your mind. It's what you've embraced in your heart. It's not just what you think about God. It's what you actually do in living for him that actually counts. Because faith is a verb. It's an action. It's a lifestyle. It's a way. In fact, Jesus spent a lot of time talking to his followers about this. There was one of his more famous or more well-known parables called the parable of the sower. We see it in Mark chapter 4. We see it in Matthew chapter 13. And he describes the response to the gospel this way. He says, a farmer went out to scatter his seed, to sow his seed. And some of the seeds that he threw, they landed on the path. And as soon as those seeds landed on the path, the birds would come and eat the seeds. And the seeds would never sprout, never never grow, never bear any fruit. Some of those seeds fell on soil that had rocks in it. And there was just enough soil for the plant to get started. But once it hit the rock, there was no foundation. The sun would come out and burn the plant, and it would die because it had no root. Then he said there were some seeds that fell on really good soil, but there were thorns all around it. So when the, the plant shot up, the thorns sort of choked it. And it, it wasn't able to bear any fruit. It died. And he said that there was good soil, and some of that soil produced 30 times, 60 times, or 100 times that which was sown. And the disciples are like, what does that parable mean? And Jesus said, the seed is the word of God. And every time the word of God is taught, every time the message of the gospel is taught, there's a seed that's sown, and it lands on a certain type of heart. That's the soil of your heart. And for some people, you hear it, and you're like, I can be forgiven of my sin. I can have a whole new life, and it's all exciting, but right away the Bible says the devil can snatch that idea out of your mind, and you walk out of church like you never heard it, and you go back to living your regular life. Jesus said the parable of the rocks is people who get excited and they, they receive it in their mind, but there's no, there's no root. There's no sustainability. And as soon as something bad happens, as soon as something wrong happens on Monday, oh, I can't do that faith thing. I got to go back to my life. That third group, the, the thorns, they, the word is impressed. You hear it. You're excited about it. You actually start reading the Bible and praying. You go to get baptized. You, you enter into a relationship. But then it says the deceitfulness of wealth and the worries of life slowly start to choke your young faith 
until it becomes less and less relevant to your life. And pretty soon you find yourself going to church once a month and then once every six months and then just a year. You find your faith is slowly choked by life. But then Jesus says there's some people. Your heart is like this fertile soil and the gospel comes and you are so excited of the reality that Jesus loves you, that he has a calling in your life, and he's given you all of these gifts, and you begin to, to share with other people, and you reproduce your passion in your life and discipleship in 30 people, or 60 people, or 100 people. And he says, that's the invitation. What type of soil is in your heart? How are you building your house? You see, at the end of it all, this evaluation process, evaluation process will happen to all of us. Revelation 21 talks about another judgment. It's called the great white throne judgment. And it's what the gospel has impacted our life. And some will be separated to heaven and some to hell. This is the end of all of our days. We will live one life and then we will die and then we'll be judged. And if we're with Christ, we have nothing to fear. We have everything to look forward to because he has paid our debt and he has died in our place and he has given us a brand new life that we can walk and embrace. And so we don't have to live in internal, eternal insecurity. We can live in the security we have in Christ Jesus. And I think that's something to celebrate as Christians that he has paid our debt. But we want to be people, listen, that tell ourselves the truth. So you can write that down. Tell yourself the truth. Don't be the person who lies to yourself or rationalizes yourself when, when it's not real. Hey, Jesus, aren't we buds? Aren't we close? You know, we talk all the time. No, I, I don't know you, man. Don't be that person. And then finally, if we look at verse 15, we see again a side of Jesus that, that maybe you're not familiar or even completely comfortable with. It's the side that says, hey, we should beware, take heed of false prophets. There are people who look like sheep, but they're actually ferocious, ravenous wolves dressed up like sheep, and they are to be discerned or judged. Now you're like, wait a second. Didn't Jesus say, don't judge or you'll be judged? No, there's a difference between being judgmental and exercising judgment. A big difference. Here's how I know this. How many men in the house, you have a teenage daughter or a young daughter? Raise your hand if you have a daughter. Any of the guys in the house? Okay, so let's say your daughter's 16. And you get this knock on the door one day. And there's a 25-year-old guy stand at the door. He's like, oh, I'm here to take your daughter out. Some of you are trying to imagine that scenario. Do you say, well, judge not. I can't judge the guy. I don't know his life. Yeah, go, go take her out. Go, go, go whatever, whatever you want. Be home whenever you want. You know, hey. Just like, no, you're not going to do that. A person is known by their fruits. There are people that dress up great. The devil dresses up great. He might be here today. I don't really know. I mean, the Bible says that we are to be discerning, not to be judgmental, but to exercise discernment, to exercise judgment. You're looking for the behaviors of people who say one thing and do another. So you're looking at this 24 hour guy and you're like, yeah, first of all, my daughter's my most precious possession. So the answer is no. But if you come back and mow my lawn and we have 16 conversations about purity and wisdom and integrity, maybe we can go on a double date and I'll be right next to you. And then maybe eventually I put a tracker on you. But listen, I'm not afraid to go to jail for you. You understand? She is my most precious possession. That's what I'm talking about. That's called being a shepherd. That's called being a shepherd of the sheep. Because there are sheep in life and there are wolves in life, but there are also sheep dogs. And we are called to be sheep dogs. There are elders. There are, there are security people here right now that are here to make sure that this is a safe place. To make sure that, that people are not going to prey on people. You see, there are people who come in here every week. We're just going to be real for a second. Can we be real? People come in here every week and they're like, you know what, I'm looking around and go, man, if I made like 10 business connections every single service... I'll be making some major bank in the next couple of months. I see a business opportunity here. Some of you, you followed a girl in here. You're sitting three rows behind her. You've been keeping an eye on her. But guess what? We're watching you. We're watching you. Just so you know. Just turn around and look. Those little earpieces aren't iPods. Why? Because if you love something, you protect it. And we're called to love the people of God and protect the people of God and make this a safe place where people who have predatory behavior cannot just go and do whatever they want. That's not, that's not what Jesus is talking about. 
you will know them by their fruit. And you can tell right away when you confront someone if they're a wolf. You know how? Because you say, hey, hey, hey bro, you know, you're, you're hanging out in the kids' ministry, but you don't have any kids. And you're talking about God gave you a revelation. You want to give, you want to show the kids your new motorcycle out front. Listen. And the guy's like, oh, no, no, judge not unless you be judged. You're trying to judge my motives. Oh, yeah, you know that's a wolf right there. Okay, let's escort you off the property and let's love you. Let's love you another place because you're not here to play a game. We're going to protect our kids. We're going to love our people. And we're going to honor God in the process. That's part of what the church is. It's a family. And families protect each other. Families watch each other's backs. That's what the church is. This is a safe place for you to grow, for you to heal, for you to serve. And we're grateful for all the people who make that possible here. So, sorry, that wasn't all my notes, but I just kept on going. Be careful of wolf language. Wolf speak, don't judge me. How long do you want the house that you're building to last? Because Jesus is saying, you want to evaluate. How long? Do you want the life that you're building to last? And if you want it to last in eternity and be safe and secure when storms come and be life-giving and full and vibrant, Jesus is saying, there is a way that can happen by my grace if you hear my words and put them into practice. And the thing is, even with the hard sayings of Jesus, when people heard this entire sermon, the last sentence we see in verse 28 is the people were astonished at his teaching. They were like, wow, he's not just sugarcoating stuff. He's speaking real truth about real life, and he's inviting us into this kingdom. And I pray today that if there's an area of your life that you know you want to get right as you rebuild your house, that you take a step of faith and you confess, God, I want to rebuild my house in this area of my life. If you do not know Jesus, that you would get saved today and that God would do a miraculous work in your life. We're going to pray and trust that God's going to do that right now, right here in this house. Let's pray together. Father, I pray right now we'd be willing to trust your wisdom. Jesus, that we'd hear your words and not just embrace them, but to put them into practice and that you would now begin to stir us to think about what that looks like as we invest in other people and step outside of our bubble, our comfort zone. Maybe rethink the way we're living our lives, the way we're spending our money, the things we're watching and listening to, the the way we're relating to other people. Help us not to see other people as currency, what they can do for us. Help us to see people as brothers and sisters made in the image of our almighty father, that we would love and serve each other, fulfill the golden rule, and be such an attractive witness to this world that's in desperate need to know there can be a house that's built that lasts forever. Give us those eyes to see. We pray this in Jesus' name. Hey, before we say amen and before we close our service, here's the invitation. The invitation is, if you don't know that you are going to heaven when you die. You have a chance right now to walk out of this place knowing that is a fact. I'm gonna ask if you're a Christian here in this place just to pray for just the next few moments because for someone who doesn't know Jesus in a personal way, if someone needs to repent today and get right, this is the most important part of the service. You see, sometimes we get under the assumption, you know, hey, when, I, when I raised my hand when I was five years old or when I walked forward, you know, then that, that was pretty much it. I don't have anything else to do, but... Jesus is saying that belief is associated with action. You can't just say you believe and then not act because that's what the devil does. The devil believes that Jesus is the son of God, the savior of the world. The devil believes that Jesus died on a cross for the sins of the world. The devil believes that God raised him from the dead and he sits at the right hand of the father. The devil believes all those things. But he's not going to heaven because he refuses to submit to that fact and give his life to God. So many people believe the right things but never give their life to God. They hear the words of Jesus, but never put them into practice. And today you have a chance to put them into practice. The most horrible words that you'll ever hear in life, the words that Jesus said, some people will hear, I never knew you. And the greatest words that you'll ever hear in your life are these words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom of heaven that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We want everyone to hear that second sentence. We want everyone here to walk out knowing they're going to hear those words. And it starts with a moment of repentance where you say, God, I haven't been living in your ways. Even if I believe the right things, I haven't practiced them in my life, so forgive me. Maybe you struggle with self-righteousness. 
Maybe you struggle with just a sense of brokenness that you don't think God could even touch. You're so broken, you don't believe God could really heal you, give you a new life. Whatever that is, we want to give you a chance to respond to the life-saving message of the gospel. So we're going to close with a song, and if you want to start that relationship with God, if you want to repent of your sins, we're going to ask you to stand up out of your seat and walk this way toward this altar. There's room here for anyone who will come. And God will embrace you and forgive you. And if you offer your life to him, he will lead you in a way that is so far better than your own leadership of your own life. Here's the invitation. God loves you so much. He gave his only son. Whoever believes, whoever comes, he will not cast out. He will save, he redeem, and he will heal. If that's you, as the song plays, you come. And we're clapping because we know what this means. We know what it meant for us. Some of us, we got saved here in this church. Some of us a long time ago. Some of us not even in a church, but all of us remember the moment where we knew we needed our hearts to get right with God. Where we needed the weight that we were carrying, the weight of guilt and shame, the guilt of sin, to be taken from us. So in a moment, something amazing is going to happen. You're going to pray a prayer. God, take my sin. Jesus, forgive me, and he's going to take away all the guilt and the shame and the, and the regret of all that sin. He's going to take it on himself, and he's going to give you this, this peace and a sense of forgiveness. The Bible says that he's going to separate your sins from you like the east is from the west. You're not going to be able to go back and reach them. He's going to forget them. This is a beautiful, beautiful picture of salvation and forgiveness. And none of us deserve this. That's why we call it grace, the undeserved gift of God. He's going to pour his spirit into you. and He's going to give you wisdom and purpose. So many things are going to happen in the next few moments and the next few steps of your journey that you'll be able to reflect back on this moment and go, I can't believe it was on that weekend after Easter in 2018 when Jesus changed my life. And one day, you'll stand before God and you'll hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. So we're going to pray that prayer in a moment, but I just want to offer a just one more opportunity for anyone who's there. Maybe you think for yourself, you know, I'll, I'll do this. I want this for myself. But maybe next week or the week after. And I just want to say that tomorrow is not promised. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to make you evaluate and think. Tomorrow is not promised. And there was a man in service last night who passed away. He came here not knowing it would be his last day. But he was ready. God had redeemed his life. And now he's in the presence of Jesus because of his faith in Christ. And 
We want you to know that assurance when you leave this place today. So if that's you, if you don't know that you know that you have eternal life, just summon the courage to stand up out of your seat and walk this way. Please don't miss this opportunity because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. You can respond to the love of God. Wherever you are, if that's you, summon the courage to make the most important decision of your life and stand up and walk this way. And we'll celebrate that with you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm really glad you're here. Really glad you're here. And now I'm going to lead you in that prayer. It'll be my words, but it's an expression of your heart to God, and he will hear and answer this prayer because our God keeps his promises. Pray this out loud after me. Say this, Lord God, I open my heart, and I invite you inside. Forgive my sin. Today I repent. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit, and I will walk with you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, we are so excited for you as you've joined our family. And so here's what we'd love to do. If you could just give us five minutes of your time. And you can follow me and Roy and Christian over to those open doors. We want to put a Bible in your hand, a Bible study guide, and just pray for you. So if you can give us those five minutes, if you can, just follow me. Let's give them a hand as they go. Church, can we stand? Let's all stand. Two announcements as you guys are ready to go. Um, if you want to connect with one of those project teams Doug talked about in Vision 2023, we're going to have a meeting right after service in the Commons. And if you've never heard of the Commons, it's the area um, just to the right of the grill. Um, if you're going that way or if you go right through our Calvary Kids area and go straight across that plaza, it's in the Discipleship Building. So if you want uh, to know more information on how to get plugged in and how can I um, use my gifts to help us accomplish this vision. Um, right after service, there'll be pastors and leaders over there to help connect you with that. And then also Wednesday night, don't forget, um, Wednesday night, the next six weeks, we're gonna be having worship and Bible study, but the Bible study is gonna be, how do I become a better disciple? How do I make better disciples? So don't miss that opportunity for you to grow in your faith, or maybe how can you help someone else grow in theirs? Amen? I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Anybody gonna watch the Masters? Okay, handful of you. Go to the beach, go have fun, go spend time with your family, love your neighbors. We love you guys. Be blessed. Have a great rest of your day. You're dismissed.